here we are in April, and uh, I'm deciding with the central powers. They don't. They have the money to make offers diplomatically, but they don't terribly want to. Bulgaria is not going to do much for them. They could make Bulgaria an offer with a plus one on it. Okay, great. Romania is a value, but it would be an even up offer. Not terribly interesting to them. And to tell you the truth, kind of scary to Russia too. Neither side has the army to extend the front down to cover Romania. Um, on the other hand, the Russians might say, oh, well, if we're losing the game, we'll try for it, right? But uh, the other side of it, though, is France can still go for Italy, and the same situation still applies. So on a one or a six, we're going to bring Italy into the game. And same offers are being made. Oh, and Italy just went central power. And I think that may bring Britain in immediately. No, oh, Italy went EP. Okay. Well, there's... We didn't know which way it went. Uh, there's a problem for the uh, the Austrians then, and that means Britain is not automatically coming in. And without Britain in, you don't get Turkey, you don't get Japan, la la la. All right, let's set up the Italians. So there's something a little odd here. Um, I bought more troops, more whatever. Versa. Uh, Verdun was improved, yeah, Versailles was improved. Yeah. Um, you can see this is one of the advantages the ax, uh, Central Powers have. Yeah, we've been playing too much World War II recently. And there we go. Come on, come on. Stupid zoom is broken. I don't like my newer camera though, so. Um, it's yellow. Uh, they have so much money, at least in this uh, situation, without Britain in the game. Now, with Italy coming in, my first thought was, wow, they don't look like a major power. Yeah, they are. They have counters for all the major power capabilities. They have an income. But they don't start with any money from what I can see. I didn't see anything that indicated it. And then I see here, the United States joins the EP during the diplomacy phase, la, la, la. Um... The U.S. will enter the war with zero RP since it was still neutral during the resource population phase. That sounds like that's the same situation the Italians are in. They have no starting money in this scenario. Uh, which means bringing them in on anything except the, uh, the month before a resource tabulation, the, the interfaces, is probably kind of a mistake. So, you know, I'm allowing... I'm going to continue with it because, to some extent, the chance of bringing them in was kind of important. If they went the wrong way, the Brits would come in, and they're clearly valuable. And I had such a low op opportunity, to, uh, such a low chance of bringing them in. But it does kind of uh, make them useless for two turns, really, <laughs> you know. Uh, but And the Austrians can strike them. We can look at that as kind of their finishing mobilization period, but they do have a lot of forces on the board. We'll see what they can do with them. Um, at least they can move. It's not one of those games where you have to pay to move your pieces. And I think that's about it. Uh, in the admiralty phase, here we've got a real problem for the Austrians because now they might just get blockaded. Um, with an Italian Navy in place, there's a French battleship down here. There's actually a force capable of doing something. Of course, it can't do anything yet because there's no money, but... First General Quarters turn, the French start streaming uh, their ships out to um, 
finish off the uh, distant blockade of the Austrian territory. The Austrians respond throwing a U-boat out. I've got to think about what I want to do. I leave the battleship behind. I don't want to pay for that. I've got the Italian Navy, which I can... Uh, well, actually, I can't afford to fight with. That's the problem, because I don't have a resource yet. So the French might end up kicking around uh, down near Italy. But um, I've got a possibility to send the German U-boats around over into the Mediterranean. One of the problems is, if I start using U-boats, even Austrian ones, I'm going to drive the ASW value up. And that means that my capacity for really wrecking the British economy, once they come in, and they will eventually, if I'm going to win this game, I think, uh, goes down. So I've got to really consider whether or not I want to uh, engage there. You can see that early on, that distant blockade isn't too terrible. The next couple of years, uh, the per season cost, it's not pleasant, uh, but I'm probably not going to be able to defeat it with just the U-boat. Certainly not with just one. So I got to kind of think about this, whether or not uh, I want to do it. Intriguing stuff going on in the first campaign, uh, Fortnite. Um, Cluck sent just the artillery to fire here. He can do that. And it succeeded in knocking Verdun down a step. That's great. But now, in next Fortnite, maybe I'll attack there. But right now, I launched my main attack in this direction. And I should get a little trench marker, because I may want to make a different attack in that same direction. And I have to know that I cannot. Uh, I don't think one's positioned here for the artillery fire. I'm not sure, but it, I'm not planning on making any attacks there, so it wouldn't matter much. But it did bring to mind one thing. The reduction markers, having to pick them up, move them, and go to the box, removing them from the board. Honestly, I prefer the uh, La Grande Guerre sit, uh, solution of having fortresses on the map. I think the amount of counters would be about the same, to tell you the truth. Uh, there are a lot of fortresses on the map, but they gave you a lot of these reduction counters. And I just think it would be clearer. It would make setup a little bit more painful, especially in the big scenario. But in terms of, uh, you know, cleaning up the map when fortresses disappear, I think it would be more pleasant. <laughs> because the problem is, when I'm looking through a stack to see if I want to attack it, I'm interested in what's there. And it's kind of a... This is like the strength point markers in games like Terrible Swift Sword or Great Battles of Ancient History or whatever. I'm less interested in what's not there, or that doesn't compute as easily. Maybe it's just me. Uh, but when I see lots of negative markers on something, that doesn't necessarily um, work for me. So, for example, in terrible swift sword if there's a big stack of counters and a lot of them i may make my judgment based on whether or not to attack something on how big that stack is right well <laughs> if a lot of them are informational counters that are telling me it's not that big a stack um it sort of reverses the kind of thinking that you do now obviously the worst of all cases is something like the uh, cwb uh, series where you really don't have that information coming to you in any sense of the word. You can't even kind of skim down along the side and see, hey, is that a white counter or a colored counter or what? And try to make your judgment that way. Anyway, that's just some weird random thoughts on this. I gotta turn these guys. They've completed their movement. It's connected, uh, launched another attack against Balfort. And over here on the east front, they made a couple against the rail line. One of them was successful in the sense that they took the hex. The other one, Mackinson, got sacked over, um, along with a couple of points of, uh, of uh, demoralization happening. The Russians had a shot at a demoralization on this one. It didn't happen. Uh, the Ludendorff attack succeeded. The Russians could have taken an attrition loss and tried to hold the hex, but there's not much value to holding this hex. Giving ground is more valuable. Losing the unit 
it seemed more cost effective. I'm kind of worried about my economy collapsing due to these demoralization results. Um, so I gave up the units instead. Now the tank, uh, the trench battle marker there meant that the Germans couldn't move more reinforcements in, uh, you know, launch a semi-breakthrough or anything like that because they didn't get a breakthrough result. All they got was a give ground. Um, actually they got the 10 which... So, um, you know, they're able to gain that space but that's it. But that space is kind of important because it kind of starts to drive a wedge between the two Russian lines and it's helping to degrade the Russian position out here or this one it's hard to tell um, we'll see you know if the Germans can follow that up with anything they do have a nice stack of units at Konigsberg uh, with which I could actually hit this I don't know how much that does for me though hmm because see the thing is that an attack there could actually gain me some real ground and I do have a fortification here to help defend Konigsberg. So the reason this could actually gain me something is I could hit with well with five counters this is here right now could move up to the front um, or I could hit with just three counters which would still give me a bonus. I think it's worth making. I got a good result there but it wasn't a major battle, so it's not going to cause a demoralization check. Um, it's not going to give me any TI benefit. But it does allow me to push these units into this hex. This hex also has a trench battle marker. But I'm really degrading the Russian position there. And now we'll leave it to the uh, Allies for their first fortnight move. I don't want to do much with the Austrians. I've spread them out a little bit more to cover the gap. You can see the Greeks have moved up. I did that early. And as the first fortnight in April ends, the Russians kind of eh, didn't really do much. Shifted their forces a little bit. Ooze down here in preparation of a possible attack on another Austrian uh, population center. Nothing the Italians can do. The French move Joffre over here, try to counterattack. It didn't gain any, uh, it didn't regain that ground. I'm not sure that's terribly a big deal either way. Uh, you know, there's more of a chance of a breakthrough if that goes away. But a breakthrough doesn't mean much if there are enough forces there to absorb it, I guess. So, from what I can see and now there are um, so this was kind of an attritional attack and an attack that boosted the TI you can see the Entente TI is way under the Central Powers one and that's kind of frightening it, just in terms of gee I really ought to be getting my tech up but the problem is I'm having a hard time finding places where I can legitimately attack a larger stack at the low amount of money that I have left for both the Germans and the French, or the Russians and the French. The Germans have a pile of cash or resources or whatever available. I'm also considering the, oh geez, you know, if the Russians can kind of slip around the back, but the only way you can kind of slip around the back is very, very slow. Uh, not one move per fortnight, which the entrenched units can do, certainly not the speed of a regular unit you need to maintain supply so if you can't blast your way through the the rail net the other way around is to slowly kind of ooze around the enemy and spend once per month uh, a turn building the infrastructure that you can like then draw your supply another hex further another hex further and that's kind of what the Germans are looking at as a possibility for undermining the Russian line as well wherever there's a gap that's kind of what happens oh yeah the Serbs uh, blew away the Greeks if I didn't catch that pointless uh, German attacks the Austrians really can't afford any and 
and uh, let's see what we've got here. We made uh, another attack here on Verdon. Totally worthless. Um, I really ought to stop doing that. I don't know. You know, somehow that arrow is just like a, a lodestone that forces me to want to make that attack again and again. But it really doesn't help at all. It's just a hindrance. And honestly, I'd be better off making other attacks. I had could have had bit better odds in some other direction. But I have the siege artillery in that stack. And the siege artillery tells me, oh, you really want to hit for done because if I hit it again successfully, I destroy it. And that would be great. Otherwise, if I don't, the French can just rebuild it. Now, I don't have the rebuild costs in front of me. Um, they're not on the chart, unfortunately. I don't remember if it was one or two, but the French have enough money to rebuild it, even though it might be kind of iffy for them to choose to do so, because they do not have a lot of money. They have two bucks there, uh, so bad things could happen. They could get bled dry, which is really what Verdun was about, right? And then over here, well, kind of lousy attack over here, and then a somewhat better one by Ludendorff, uh, which I had to kind of recuperate from by moving some units. But in both cases, this one um, there were reinforcements into. This one there were not. Uh, but it's tough to... The results don't necessarily come out very well. Actually, this one was a horrible die roll, a two, but I was actually at pluses, which is really hard to get once you get into trench warfare. But between Ludendorff, a better unit, etc., I was able to bust up the uh, Russian uh, line there. And they probably can't hold that line. The question is, do I fall back and give the Germans ground, which they may or may not be able to advance into. I think I have a Cav under Ludendorff left, which Cav is really awesome because you can move your leaders around. <laughs> The leaders don't move on their own, as far as I can tell. Um, I think that's the intention. Anyway, that becomes the biggest advantage of the cav, is you can run up, grab your leaders, and move them into place so that they can uh, they can give their extra plus one. Um, I don't know how much is gained if I break that line, because more Russians will be built. There's tons of them there. There's, well another one coming in here that I already bought but you know it's it's a matter of trying to win this attritional battle of course I don't necessarily want to knock Russia all the way into uh, into a position where they collapse because that brings Britain in <laughs> over here I'm afraid the Serbians are gonna just march down and take all the Greek territory <laughs> and I don't know anything I can do about it um, I can start walking my way slowly up the rail line to prevent them from taking Athens, but there really isn't a hell of a lot I can do. It looks like Salonika is going to fall. It doesn't have any real defensive value to it, uh, which I think means that the fleet is still there, but no longer able to protect itself with the port. <laughs> it's really a strange game. Um, the the you know, you're, you're making these attacks, you know they're futile, largely. Although, honestly, the attacks in the East, I have hopes for, like I'm making them at reasonable odds. Uh, the attack on Verdun, no, I'm not. But I might end up costing France more than, like, I'm losing, maybe, if I get lucky. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, anyway, I doubt that there's much... Uh, that the Entente wants to do. I've got another month coming. I don't have any money, really. The Russians have four bucks. The French can't really afford to make an attack. So I finish up uh, the turn without the Russians making an attack, kind of falling back. There's this weird little, and the French as well, uh, do not do anything. They pretty much stayed the same. But there's this weird little dance that I've started to learn, which is mobilize units in every hex. Make sure that they're, you know, on their movement side. Uh, the reason for that is they're easier to use as reinforcements in that case, and then you get a, a better defensive benefit. So you're actually 
in a stronger defensive, and it kind of makes sense if you're not thinking in purely World War One terms, and maybe if you are, um, you keep a mobile reserve that you can push into location. Now, the best place to have it is behind the lines, far enough where it can push into any of the other hexes. Then it gets two bonuses on that. Uh, of course, if you don't have a many troops, you can't have that. And I need this unit here, because otherwise, what can the Germans do? Well, we don't know for sure, but if they could push into this hex, then I could slam behind here and attack uh, the Russians while they're out of supply, because I just cut them off. So there's these strong reasons to, like, do things that make sense, you know, in, in a World War I type sense, which is, like, keep the continuous lines, etc. Which kind of otherwise wouldn't make sense. And I, I think... I'm not sure whether or not it's brilliance on the game or there's a flaw to it, right? <laughs> it's one or the other, and I don't know which, which is... If you're in the mobile stage of the game, you can kind of just charge down these rail lines and grab them up. And there's a lot of advantage to that, but I think there's a bigger advantage to setting up in a defensive position, right? To take that trench bonus so that you hold on to what you've got. Because you can always mobilize your units, since you have to pay for each die roll that you're attacking, um, it kind of makes sense to say, okay, well, I, if I'm only going to make one attack, I want to make sure that I'm not dislodged from where I am. So, the brilliance of that is potentially that it captures sort of that mobile part of the war. Um, but the problem with it is, I think there's too much incentive to dig in too early. And I think that's why other games don't really have, you know, that... They, they have this, you're not allowed to dig in until late in 14. And then everybody digs in because it's just so advantageous. Here, there's no such artificial restraint on you. Ah, you know, these Germans, I've forgotten to move them twice. Uh, I set them up to send them down to go help the Austrians. Again, though, you know, I think the... German-Russian color is too close. Look at the German-Italian. I mean, you can tell with the camera, but my blind eyes uh, in this light cannot see that difference very well. Uh, and there's a lot of glare and everything, so it really becomes unclear. Really, all the dark colors kind of blend in together. <sighs> I do not have that problem with most war games. <laughs> this one... The color choices are really causing me problems. Pushing upward to the uh, campaign side of the turn. Uh, the little arrow has to be moved back to where it belongs. Um, a few troops trickled in. More on the central power side than anywhere else. Uh, decided to purchase limited extra forces, and the French increased were done as well. Um, the, the Russian was probably the hardest purchase to make, because that dropped them down to two bucks. The French repairing Verdun wiped them out, which means the Germans have kind of an opportunity here to at least kill more units. The Germans actually didn't spend too much uh, they kept their own costs somewhere. Ah, they're, they're at seven bucks, so they can actually make a few more attacks. And as long as they're able to make attacks, they're able to keep pumping this value up. We do have a fair distance to go, though, before uh, we're going to be able to make TI attacks. So. I'm noticing the diplomacy-wise, ah, yeah, nobody decided to spend. Um, for the French, the Entente, um, the feeling was, well, spending on a random, you know, equal distribution in favor or against on something like Romania doesn't make a whole hell of a lot of sense. And likewise with Bulgaria. I think that would be split evenly as well. It doesn't make sense to spend money uh, to try to shake things up there. 
uh, if I had extra money, the Romania chance would be greater because what I'd be giving up for the Russians in the uh, Odessa region in Bessarabia over here, eh, that would be safe to give up, right? Uh, whereas what Austria is risking in terms of the Romanian side is more dangerous. So it might be worth making that, that attempt there. Bulgaria certainly not. For the Central Powers, well, yes, I'm kind of losing Greece here, or at least a big chunk of it, but again, it's not worth trying to shake things up. The only thing, the danger of Romania is too high, and Bulgaria really isn't going to help us that much. So I held off there. You know, I feel like it's not worth going for the miners unless I want to shake things up and have the money, or... <clears throat> um, or if I have a real advantage in my direction. Um, and navally, I couldn't think of anything I want to do. You know, basically, it just doesn't make sense. The French move their fleet up into place, well, then it'll get attacked. It might get attacked anyway, but chances are that I can stop the Austrian fleet. Uh, the Austrian if it's moving, it would have to bring the battleship. And it's uh, one, two, three, four, five, six. And then I'd start coming into range and be stopped. And then the French can flee, you know, uh, rather than face it or whatever. Um, actually, the French don't have a buck, so they can't move their battleship. Austria doesn't really have the money to move theirs either. But if I tried to build the blockade, the Austrians would spend to go destroy it, right? So, uh, it doesn't look worth uh, trying to set up there. And I think that's about it. Um, so, on to moving. Observation that I'm making, and I, I haven't looked at the later scenarios, so I don't know if I'm facing the same kind of issue. This is actually giving a very Le Grand Care uh, situation in terms of there being a lot of destroyed units and I don't have the cash to rebuild the army to keep it at full size, uh, which I think is a historical. Uh, I think the armies did not mainly spend their time over there on the sideboard as it were. And some of that reason is I want to be able to do something with my armies. I want to be able to have some offensives. I want to increase the TI. And I'm running into the same kind of situation that I was in La Grande Guerre, where this just looks too thin, too thinly populated. I'm stretched to the limit in most places, and you know, only only one unit per hex, etc. Uh, now, in this game, that's not quite as devastatingly bad a situation to be in as it is in La Grande Guerre, where really breakthroughs are quite easy. Well. Maybe they are, because if I can send two or three units in, but the value of a breakthrough seems low. Uh, knocking out a single hex without getting any TI increase uh, just doesn't really impress me in terms of my long-term survivability. When you spend whatever resources you do spend on, uh, on using, uh, on making an attack in La Grande Guerre is so minor compared to what it feels like in here uh, in terms of actually launching uh, launching an attack against a single hex. Maybe because you have to pre-decide in that game how much artillery you're buying, therefore, you know, how much, not artillery, but how much ammo you're buying, therefore you're like already committed to those attacks on paper. Here, uh, it feels more like you're spending actual units. Uh, though in, in the other game, you can stockpile your ammo and you know keep it for, for some later point. There is one other thing. In Le Grand Guerre, there is this necessity to launch a, a, attacks, to launch a major offensive. And there's no, and, and you have it in Paths of Glory too. There's no real overriding demand for it in this game other than you may want to increase your TI attacks so that you can, you know, uh, push the game towards an end. 
Quite simply, the Entente just doesn't have the money for it. They've been stretched too hard by the Central Powers. And the Central Powers have been concentrating on either making a big gain here, where they can get their TI, or making their attacks against the main Russian forces, where they can get some TI, rather than trying to, you know, pick off uh, where there's sort of a secondary front, really. Um, there's much less value, I think, towards trying to gain ground in a secondary front. The uh, German, Russian, uh, well, the German and Austrian, actually, decision has been rack up the shots, especially against the Italians and French. Uh, I missed an attack on the Italians in terms of I didn't mark it, but I also didn't mark my attacks on the Russians. I get kind of sloppy because, uh, you know, I can remember what got attacked for a couple of minutes. Um, but yeah, the with this vague thought in mind of, hey, if we hit something, you know, if we get a good roll, the enemy is going to have to take actual losses instead of just, uh, instead of maybe replacement points or whatever. And we're racking up our TI, which is now up to 22 there, I think. I don't know what it's up to. It's, a, it's the lead number, 24, you know, and 36 is where we start getting, uh, you know, some benefit up from it. So it seemed like a good time to do it. And then when I was doing that, yeah, I launched an attack also towards the forest, trying to uh, widen the gap uh, on the Russian flank. I couldn't find a good attack anywhere down here. I don't really care that much about breaking this line. Most importantly, I don't care about driving these Russians back. What's that going to do for me? Well, it might open up a chance to grab a Russian fortress at some point in the game. But honestly, right now, um, taking fortresses away is just going to put Russia towards collapse, which eventually I want to do. But not necessarily something that I want to press and make terribly fast. Uh, I probably want to grab their victory point centers after they get into collapse. So the longer that I can keep them out of collapse, the longer Britain's out of the war. Yeah, no one would be thinking this way, right? But that's actually the kind of thinking that I end up having here. Is well, I'm going to avoid getting near Paris because France, uh, Britain's going to come in. I'm going to avoid uh, trying to win the war too much in Russia either. Uh, that doesn't mean that I'm not going to try to weaken Russia as much as I can. It's just that I don't have that heavy an incentive um, to go in that direction because it'll start things that I don't really want to happen. Remember, if you, if you watch my World War II videos, in that game, I always delay things as much as possible. Well, I'm doing the same here. You know? I'm delaying British entry. I'm delaying US entry. I don't want these things to happen because I think that I can actually gain territory uh, to an advance. Now, this is one of those territories I want to gain. And in a sense, it might be to my advantage to open the route up to that before I collapse the uh, forces that are sitting in Poland. Um, the problem is, this attack costs me the same and doesn't get me any TI advantage. And maybe it'll be easier once I have TI. <laughs> Much the Entente could do, but now in the second fortnight, the Germans probably hose themselves over. Um, another attack here against Jaffra. It's funny because this advance here, it, nobody's attacking in either direction, yet it remains. And that feels kind of funny. I mean, sure, there's a bulge that's kind of cut off and everything, but uh, the truth, you know, that's kind of sticking out as kind of a peninsula into the French territory is what you have to kind of look at it as. But honestly, there's time to, to entrench fully and defend it fully as far as I'm concerned, which makes it feel kind of funny that, you know, it's considered to be this major incursion uh, that can be cut off easily or whatever. It, it, it just, 
it seems like it would start to be fortified within the time as long as nobody's attacking in there. At least from my experience with games like uh, Der Weltkrieg where, you know, it, once you make those little advances, even if they're in a crappy location, they become pretty solid, you know? And if anything, they provide you with uh, the ability to kind of widen the gap more easily. Um, once you get them fortified and entrenched, as at least as much as the ability to knock the enemy out of them, which feels kind of funny. Um, got French troops beginning to make it into Italy because they're Alpine troops, and I'm planning on doing more aggressive action in Italy. But uh, for for the Germans, yeah, they made the attack there. They also made a couple of attacks here. One that was uh, actually not against entrenched units. And I used some mobile units, but they lost a unit there. And then here as well at uh, Warsaw, where they'd like to take it. Not so much for the effect of, uh, you know, on the, the Russian national will as, I mean, that counts, but also just, you know, taking the economic value of the territories. Because each, each, uh, each population center you have, they add up and it's like a third of them count towards your own economy. So I don't know if that was terribly important, but it, it seemed of some value. And also the economic value of taking them destroys some economic uh, value uh, when, when you do the hits. Unfortunately, at least one of the attacks, I think that one, no, it was a, it was a second attack against this, a mobile attack against a mobile force <laughs> that actually trying to cut that rail line, which may not be that terribly important because this serves as a means of drawing supply out to here at least. Um, and then if I built infrastructure, I could push it further. It doesn't look like the Russians are going into East Prussia any further. But uh, that ended up giving uh, a terrible result to the Germans. They took an attrition loss, so they actually had to make two rolls uh, to see if they get out of that. <sighs> I actually have some capacity to try to move Ludendorff somewhere. I may do that. If I come one, that's not Woods. Two, let's drop him down a little more this way. I could move him down to here, but if I do that, then my Swedes are stuck down there. You know what? The, Ru uh, the Russians are not going to be able to attack. They're almost out of money. They have one buck for an attack if they want to make it. And I'll let them, I'll, I'll leave that opportunity open. But I may want, I've got a mobile unit there. It's not a very good one, but it's got a chance of reinforcing. Um, I may want to stiffen my reinforcements somewhere else. Do that little dance of trying to mobilize units or whatever. Um, and... In terms of the bleeding, you know, I'm doing damage to the French and, and the Russians to some extent, and, and maybe the Italians, but I'm actually doing more damage to the Germans. Look, that's their stack of three-point units. That's going to be hard to rebuild. And that's the problem with not taking attrition losses, is that <laughs> you end up paying more to replace those units. You don't take the, the morale loss, but... You know, I was kind of like, well, I've taken enough attrition losses. That's going to cost me in the long run more. But it's a hard, hard call because you're losing your ability to punch forward as, as you start to lose your, your good units, I guess. Got some money uh, on a, the resource track. I've started the economics for the seasonal turn. I'm running into a situation because Italy has very little money. And I'm thinking about shifting some money to them. But I'd rather not shift French money to them. Uh, for the simple reason that the Russians have more money, eh, the French have a little bit, but I'd like to squeeze uh, a little out of the Russians. I don't, I don't feel like the Russians terribly need their money as much as the French do. I feel like the French are kind of on the ropes in a way that the Russians aren't. But, uh, well, there's an obvious problem, which is trying to supply from Russia to Italy, right? Okay. Well, in order to do so, I can do sea supply. And that would make sense out of maybe Murmansk or Archangel to me. But it feels kind of weird to do it through the Baltic Sea. But when I look at the sea supply rules, uh, as long as I have the St. Petersburg box, 
with a fleet in it. I can use that as an endpoint. And then over here for the French, I have a fleet over here in Boulogne. I can use that as an endpoint. It doesn't seem to matter what's in between except in sea boxes. Uh, so the fact that there's a German Navy in the Baltic Sea isn't, as far as I read this, going to block it. Um, if I end up mining, and maybe I was supposed to, uh, but I couldn't. I couldn't get beyond. I couldn't get up to here. If I ended up mining up here, which might have made more sense, uh, I would prevent access through the Baltic. But as it stands, I think I can ship Russian resources to Italy, and I'll probably send them a couple bucks. The reason I have to send them money is one: they're going to need some to face the Austrians. But more importantly, if I want to establish that. Uh, that blockade, I need the Italian fleet to be able to operate. <laughs> Starting this the June turn, I believe. Um, first of all, lots more units showed up uh, in the replacements, but we, got, we already saw that in the summer interface. Um, some additional purchases for this turn. The Germans actually built an infrastructure purchase with the idea of, you know, a plus one, a single use plus one in a combat isn't really that ineffectual a thing. It costs you one buck, and when you're buying like a three point unit, that costs you two bucks, and you're probably going to lose that. Um, the Germans are actually really having a problem in terms of not enough manpower on the field. But because they have so many different types of unit in terms of strength points available, it's hard for them to justify buying too many different, uh, you know, trying to buy their way down around again to a three, even though they have money. So they're going to trickle them in, but that extra plus one might be really valuable. So I bought one of them. You can see I also bought the Eindecker, which I can use. Uh, conceivably to oppose bombing uh, operations. The French did not bow, build their airplane. The bombing's just not that valuable, but an airplane is valuable in terms of giving you a modifier. So maybe that was a mistake, but the problem is they had to build Verdun um, back up. They had so many things and not a lot of money. They're down to four bucks left <laughs> and just feeling they actually bought a lot of different troops, uh, which gives them a little bit more staying power than the Germans have. We also had some uh, some naval operations as the French continue to move forward on their demonstration against the Adriatic. The problem with this is, so this is almost a game of bluffing in, in a sense. Like if the French go in here and position themselves, the Austrian fleet with its battleship can move forward, but that costs money to move and it probably won't make it the whole way down there without being stopped by the screen well, either the Italian ship or the screen of, of subs or whatever. It's and eventually by this fleet, in which case, you know, it has to wait another turn before it actually engages and pay another buck to do so. And I kind of don't want to commit because Austria is not exactly wealthy either. After their builds, they're at seven bucks. Uh, Italy didn't want to build their airplane because they're only at five or six bucks, um, but they are building some infantry. <laughs> we got a whole pile of stuff I moved in here for next spring. Baton, a bunch of Brits that, you know, at, at some point I have to start, I have to move these <laughs> over into counter trays. But the thing is, I've got my timed counter. These are the replacements coming in. And then this over here is holding, well, the Turks which I could actually move over to this one and then I'd have room probably to handle everything. But, you know, so far it's holding up, but at some point I'm going to have, looks like autumn, all those Russians coming in. I'm facing the same issue I do in La Grande Guerre. 
I got a lot of pieces and I can't get them all on the board. I can't afford to put them on the board and hold up any level of attacks, you know. <laughs> and so when you're attacking, well, you prevent the other guy as well, but neither side is able to throw a bunch of troops on the board. Uh, so you don't end up with the amount that you expect. Winter time's sort of a respite because attacking is so expensive then that it doesn't seem worthwhile. But winter time also ends up, um, well, I mean, you get to get some of your troops back, but you, <laughs> you can't make up for the losses over the year. And you could say, well, the losses were horrendous and all. Yeah, but uh, there's a reason there's this big counter mix, and if you look at the other scenarios and everything, I'm sure, although not positive, that many of these counters are set up. And that's the exact situation Le Grand Guerre has, which is that the historical amount of counters that were on the board don't match what the campaign gives. And it's very difficult to justify, I don't make a whole hell of a lot of attacks. I'm not blowing money left and right on them, but I am making a couple of attacks each turn. <laughs> And it runs out of money in terms of, and causes more deaths. I forgot to mention, I think, I made the Romanian risk with the, uh, with the Russians. I spent a buck to try to bring Romania onto, uh, into the game. I just think it'll do more damage to the Austrians than it would to the Russians. It's an even chance, one in six for each side, but neither side got them. Over here on the east front, Ludendorff managed to gain some ground against a Russian unit I forgot to entrench. It was the same one he hit last time. Um, and in doing so, he caused the Russian line to fall back a little. On the other hand, the Russians uh, launched a counterattack on him. It was not entirely unsuccessful. And then an attack down here. The French are holding off attacking, I think. No, I launched an attack over here. Um, to whatever effect that had and you know these attacks cost you more than they cost your opponent but in the terms of the attritional nature of the game knocking out the opponent's pieces is pretty cool in, in a lot of ways so um, I don't know but we're seeing a gap developing here that's scary because I really don't have an easy way to fill that in um, on the other hand, although the Germans are building an infrastructure, I was planning on using that on the West Front as an attack method. Alternatively, though, I could try to, you know, cut off the Russian line in one direction or another with it. Um, I don't know how valuable it would really be, but we'll see. At the end of June, and I realize I the reinforcements on June, they should be over on July, the ones I bought for this turn. Um, what happened? Well, <sighs> the Germans consolidated their position here. Not a lot of attacking going on. There was an Austrian attack down here, which was very effective against the Italians, and it's kind of threatening them. We got some French moving up there. Another Austrian attack over here on Belgrade which is forcing uh, Putnik to come back and not go conquer Greece. You know, the chance of actually taking Athens is low, especially since the Greeks could just move themselves up into the mountains if it becomes a threat. Um, of course, if they do that, then the French could naval invade and la la la. Uh, so that might be a little risky. Um, on the other side, uh, over here with the Russians, again, they kind of maneuvered, gave some ground uh, to the Germans. And we're going to see what that all kind of morphs into. The big question comes down to how quickly can you slap more troops, because basically neither side has enough troops to do a damn thing right now. Um, this 1915 is kind of turning into a non-war year. And, and this is something that happened over in La Grande Guerre as well. And I don't think it accurately reflects the war at all. I'm not sure. So it's a matter of, are you going to take these offensives seriously and really press them? 
uh, which they historically did, or you know, are you going to try to build up for a big attack maybe next year or something? <laughs> In which case, you know, your opponent's going to have a lot of troops too. So you just basically wipe each other out to the point where there's no attack capable anymore. And these points, like the like the gunpowder, uh, the the artillery shells, the ammo for Le Grand Guerre, just don't serve as a limitation. It's the troop quantity, and the troop quantity just can never be rebuilt. Uh, so I'm seeing a very similar flavor to it, where the offensives are just not panning out the way that they did. They're not turning into... There's not enough troops on the field to create the big offensives, and uh, that's okay because you're seeing the same general effect, which is nothing happened. It is World War I, after all. Uh, it's just you're not seeing pieces come on the board and get killed to the degree that I think you should. Now, what degree should that be? Well, you know, obviously the Germans ha could have put a lot more pieces on the board. And they have the money, maybe this next turn, to throw some more on the board and to try to press the offensive a little further. No one else really does uh, because of attacks they've spent or been attacked during. And that's causing them issues, without a doubt. Uh, for the Italians, you know, this has turned into a, just too tough a, a nut to crack. And likewise, the Austrians don't really have a lot of forces there. Uh, and everywhere else, it's just, it's too thin to, to you know... <laughs> I want two units per space, but largely I'm settling for one per space. You can see the French are kind of thinned out to that point, too, where I, I just can't launch the attacks. Um, the Germans made an attempt to knock Joffre out. That didn't do much, you know. I mean... But we've got them almost, you know, the French are almost bled to the point, and of course the Germans too, uh, but I've got more units coming and I've got more resources where they're going to have to give ground, much as the Russians have done there. Well, there was a mistake involved. And that makes it harder and harder, you know, so for example, I'm not going to be able to lay mines across here. Not that I've bought the mines yet either. Um, yeah, well, that's the main reason I won't be able to, because uh, I just can't afford the fight. And it, this is one place where the game does shine, is that the navies really don't want to operate in the way that, like, they, there's no big gamble that I'm seeing as being worthwhile for the German navy here, uh, in the same way that there is in uh, La Grande Guerre. I don't see a built-in edge for the German navy the way there is in that game's combat system. And I think uh, some tinkering with the combat in that one would fix things. But I don't see anything that tinkers with... It may just be my, you know, my playing of these games, but that tinkers with the idea that ends up with neither side being able to commit an offensive because they've spent all their points and they no longer have an army. You know, they... they put what they can on the field, but everything's dead, you know? <laughs> Things don't move very broadly in this game. Um, I kind of had trouble. I knew I it was playing the June turn, but I had this marker over in the wrong location. But my memory said, hey, I played out the second fortnight of June. I should be in July, and looking at the last of the video, I can see that that is indeed the case. Without it, it would be hard <clears throat> to make that judgment, um, walking away the way I do, I guess one has to be more careful in recording where they are in general. But in this game, I'm finding it harder to trust my memory because not so much changes. Um, and the turns are long. Like, uh, even when nothing much is happening, it's a lot of effort to compute a combat and, and work it out, and combats are always happening. In um, Le Grand Guerre, which goes into a more detail in its combat, 
the major battles are hard to, to resolve, but the minor battles are pretty quick comparatively. This has to do with sort of a mechanical aspect, some of which uh, figuring the modifiers, etc., uh, mentally mechanical that's kind of fatiguing, and then also the way the counters actually are with these stupid arrows and stuff. Anyway, which I really don't like, although I do like much of what they represent for showing uh, you know, partial taking of a hex. Uh, where are we? So, we laid down the reinforcing forces, and the French actually bought a lot of reinforcements, which is why they have very little money left. Um, down to three, which means no offensives for them, almost, until maybe late in the, in the season. The Germans put infrastructure and a plane down here, Thoughts of taking Verdun, mistaken thoughts after I see the French deployments because over here Belfort would have been a better uh, target actually to aim at because it's already reduced. Um, but, you know, I've got my heavy artillery sitting outside Verdun. I might want to take advantage of uh, the interior lines thing to sh try to start moving. I don't remember, it's once per season or something. I'm allowed to sort of fling a heavy artillery somewhere. I like having the heavy artillery, the siege guns over on the Russian front, but I'm not facing any fortresses with the Germans. So it's quite a distance away. That's an option I have to keep in mind. But anyway, um, I've put a lot of force up against Verdun. Uh, but I probably am not going to use it there on this first move. I'm probably going to use the airplane um, to attack Jaffra again and try to get this hex. And actually, this ought to be my infrastructure hex. But it won't be. <laughs> you know, I had to drop the infrastructure now. Um, oop. You know what I forgot? I forgot that before I dropped this plane, and it's the only fighter plane, so it's the only thing that's going to give me... Ah, shit. It's the only thing that's going to give me any advantages. Yeah, I can't operate in this. The, the slightly larger counters are really hard to manipulate for me. Like, I find smaller counters easier to stack and unstack. Uh, anyway, that's really neither here nor there. That's a problem I constantly seem to have with larger counters. I'm just, my fingers aren't used to them. Um, I've got to decide whether or not anybody has any reinforcements they want to build for next turn. There's not a lot of cash available, like I said. Uh, the Germans actually have a decent amount, so they could afford to drop some serious points down. But other people, not so much. Um, it's probably worth putting a good unit down for everybody, though, but that's two bucks. Oh, that's another thing. The French could rebuild their fortification here. I don't know if I can afford to, though, at this point, so I've actually thrown one of my reinforcements in it. I'm hoping the Germans don't manage to take the hex. Um, I think it's impossible that they can take it, but they might weaken it. And one of my few valuable pieces is now dedicated to Belfort. Okay, so, uh, after moving the plane there to support any possible fighting going on there, uh, we get to the Admiralty phase and the French set up the blockade, the distant blockade, and now the Austrians have to make their choice. Is breaking that blockade a worthwhile task? Um, I think the answer is yes, and I can't really do it without my battleship. So I'm going to spend one of my few points to launch uh, a movement there, which pretty much is going to prevent me from the advances into Italy that I had hoped to make. Um, I've got a fair amount of force there, but I just don't have the points for it now. If this German unit enters into one of these hexes, I can attack using it and spend uh, the resource point from it instead. So that gives me some possibility of advances against the Italians. So we're going to set sail with this, and that costs us uh, one. And let's see where we go. We have, because I put it so far back, not a lot 
we have a six movement, five movement for the proto dreadnoughts, and we need them too. So let's sail out. There's a little bit of water here. So one, two, three, four, five. Now the six hex, somebody can stop us. And that somebody, it doesn't really matter who, the subs can do it, the Italian fleet can do it. Now on a, because I'm one over, on a one, uh, I can be stopped. Okay, that doesn't happen. There's the seventh hex. Now it's a one or a two. No. Eighth hex. One, two, three. And I'm stopped to there. I won't be allowed to continue moving. Now we go to the second admiralty phase, and here's where the Italians have to make their decision. If I don't do anything, well, actually, hold on. Uh, the French subs can attack, and they want to because they want to get the ASW number up. So hold on, I'll be back in a moment. Because of how far the Austrian fleet has moved, I've actually got contact with all three of these ships. Which means, um, contact here because these are stacks that share a zone of uh, patrol or whatever. I think I'd like to use my subs first. So let's take a look at search. I believe search is automatic. Because um, you take the total number of forces in the target force and subtract the number of searching units. And if you roll less than the total number of surface target force, uh, you find them. Well, anybody can find anything except the subs can't be found because this is a fairly large stack. Which means I have an engagement there. So, I'm going to make the sub attacks first with the French. Which means there's a possibility for the Austrian fleet to evade, but that would mean turning back and going home. I surely don't want to do that. So I'll take the attack. And I roll two dice for each attacking submarine and U-boat. Now these are actually separate combats because they're in separate hexes, but add the shooter's torpedo score and compare it to the target's armor score. Okay, well, I'd like to hit the battleship with the first sub. I've got a torpedo score of three. The two subs are the same. The battleship's armor score is 12. I have hit the battleship. I don't need any kind of special roll for this because the battleship is not being destroyed by it. Now, the sub has to return to port, but I think the battleship has to too. I think any damaged ship has to return. I'm not sure. That may only be airplanes that I'm thinking of here. I'm not seeing it here. Eight point five. If the result is less than the number of surface oh okay, so no, the entire Austrian fleet might be forced. If I roll less than the number of steps, okay, I cannot roll that. So all that happens is the sub has to return to port. And this is my nearest port, so we'll go back here. Now the other sub gets to attack. Now, here shooting the battleship is probably not my biggest concern. Um... 
I think I'd like to dink the cruiser. Now the Austrians had a chance to withdraw before this. Oh, by the way, we get it. The ASW marker is at one now. Theoretically, I have to roll, but I have no ASW marker, so I can't possibly hit. Okay, so now this sub is going to roll, and I'm going to go after uh, a CA at plus 3. 8-11, I get a hit on it. This is beginning to look iffy. Now, somewhere I get an ASW roll against this. which is still not possible to succeed, but I just want to go over it. If I can find it. Um, it's three dice, and I have to roll less than the ASW. Well, obviously, I'm not going to roll less than a one on three dice. So, as you can see, that's not going to happen. And then after that failed die roll, the ASW moves up again. The sub flees, and I have the opportunity to withdraw yet again, which I'm not going to do. I didn't have to move the Italian fleet for this battle, so I didn't have to pay for them. They're going to try to engage. Uh, maybe I should run before they do, because I can run after the submarine attack. Um, see, the Italians have a battleship. They have a couple of PDs that have a high armor factor on them and a bunch of CAs. The problem is, if I can't win the naval battle down here with the French and Italian forces split up, I'm going to suffer um, the uh, uh, the effects of the blockade. So I kind of feel like I should fight it out, even if I'm at weaker odds. So I'm going to let them engage me again. There's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, 10, 13, and I only have one die to roll. So I'm going to automatically find each other. At this point, we build the Vanguard, and the Vanguard fleet will be three cruisers for the... Uh, the Italians, and I think three cruisers for the Austrians. Now, uh, let me make sure I can deploy a damaged cruiser in this. CCs are also, I got a CC on each fleet. So it's two on each. I don't know what CCs are. Uh, in SFB, they're command cruisers. That doesn't seem right. Um, I'm thinking maybe colonial cruiser or something. I have no idea what it stands for. There's nothing in the game that lets me know, and it's a weird uh, designation to me. Okay, so we each have two, and we'll roll, well, we'll roll the dark die for the Austrians, because, I don't know, I've been using the dark die for the central powers, even though these guys have a darker. Uh, counter and basically uh, we have to roll less than or equal to our number of van ships to avoid being surprised. Now conceivably there's another battle here. Who gets to make the choice first? Because maybe those subs shouldn't have gotten to shoot first. The phasing player gets to sh search first. Uh, this was during Austrian movement. Shit. I'm going to undo those sub-attacks. So. Uh, what I want to hit is I want to hit the French fleet instead. The French fleet, maybe I just want to hit a single cruiser. 
My chance of hitting a single cruiser is still pretty good. I've got three, four, five, six, seven. Um, so yeah, let's undo that. The subcombats. Which are here. I got stopped here. I give first shot. So my first shot is going to be... Yeah, I actually uh, can hit this too if it is out. Um, so I can't see these because they're too far away, but I can see this because there's more than one of them. So we'll hit this first. And so this has a van of two and we have a van of two. We'll see if we get a surprise. Uh, both sides find each other. So now the van will fight. And we pull that French ship out of the way. These get put in firing order. And it's going to be simultaneous fire. So, uh, let's see what we got here. Okay, we got to exceed the armor. So I'm going to do the Austrian first. He'll shoot at one of the CAs. He's got a plus two to the die roll for his gunnery. And he does not exceed it. Uh, the first French ship is going to shoot at the CA. At plus two, he misses. The second one is going to shoot hmm, at the CL, just to knock it out. Well, he misses, and now the CL gets to shoot back at a CA. And he gets a hit. Okay. Now the main fleet comes into play for the second round of combat. And the main fleet for the French is not very big. All right. These are the van. These are the main fleet. Oh, I got some heavier pre-dreadnoughts here too. And this is not moving. Okay. So the first thing to fire is the battleship. And I'm going to shoot on the command cruiser. Or whatever it is. And I hit it. Okay. Now his fire value has been reduced before he got a shot. So now my two pointers get to fire first. So I'm going to fire a three pointer at that same ship. And I take it down. Okay. Now I get to fire a three pointer while well, I'll shoot it at the two point ship. Because I want to knock it out first. Five, six, seven, eight, not quite enough. Now I got a two pointer. That's a hit. Okay, but this is getting a two point hit back. I got another two pointer. I'm going to shoot it also. Yeah, it doesn't make a difference. That's going to sink that. And I got one more two pointer at this CA, which will not get a shot if it gets sunk. It does not. Now, uh, the one pointer, this is a two point ship firing back. I don't know what I want to shoot at. I'll shoot at, uh, I'll shoot at the CC because it's a little faster. Uh, yeah, because it's part of the main battle force. I've got to shoot only at the main battle force right now. I get a hit on that. Now this is used up already. And now we each have a one point ship firing. Um, this has to shoot at main battle fleet ships, so I'll shoot at the CC. And I sink it, and this will shoot at the remaining cruiser, and I sink it. Okay, so that's this battle. 
And now the Austrians have a chance to leave if they want, but they're going to stick around. Um, I got to decide whether or not, so I can try to engage the Italian fleet, but I think it can hide in port from me. But I'm not sure if it does, whether it can attack me again. And that's going to, whether it can search for me. And that's going to be the determinant here because um, I want that Italian fleet to fight. So I'll let the Austrians hunt me and get the, get the fight in if I can't get my sub shots in first. For any of that, I have to make a roll. I lost two steps of Austrian ships. So there's some chance I might be forced to return to port at this moment. And I am. So I'm going to send the Austrian fleet to the nearby port because being so far away was bad. And that means I don't suffer, I guess. <laughs> Um, returning units cannot initiate, nor are they subject to intercept or search. So they sail home, which means the idea of like subs hunting ships on their return damaged, that's not going to happen here the way it does in, say, a world at war or even world in flames. Uh, overall, was this valuable? Well, I took out a bunch of French ships at little cost. And that worked out pretty well. On the negative side, I had to pay to move my fleet. And that's what's really going to restrict uh, the naval operations in this game. Like in Great War, uh, the fact that you have to pay to get your ships moving means you want to make sure you have something to gain from it. It's not like uh, in La Grande Guerre, where you just probe out every turn that you're allowed to. The Germans aren't allowed to send their fleet out. And you think you have a chance of forcing a good battle. And, you know, um, it doesn't really cost you anything to steam your ships out in real terms. And you just end up uh, being able to fight, you know, this apocalyptic battle on the high seas when you want to. And it'll happen at some point or another. The other nice thing about this is after a round of combat, there's a chance you have to go home. So that point that you spent to go out and probe with your battleships, at least, is essentially, you know, wasted. You can't just, you can't make sure that you, you, you get this uh, climactic battle uh, <laughs> if you do end up uh, spending that point. All you can make sure is that you get one round. Now, this was pretty good for the Austrians. It reduced... Um, the French fleet significantly and that means the Italian fleet is all that there is to try to enforce a blockade on the negative side that blockade is almost set so uh, the Allies can essentially um, or the Entente can essentially try to reestablish it uh, what else? Get this back here. I don't know what else to say. All right, well, we'll just send those ships home and then we go to the ground movement. German attack on Joffre's location is particularly dangerous, but for, for the French, because they don't get um, the air superiority there gives a plus one to the Germans bombing. Um, observation, etc. But it also hinders the ability of reserves to move into there, which is going to be kind of problematic. Um, on the negative side, though, if no reserves get there, we're not going to get a TI modifier. And this hex isn't terribly important. The Germans can gain it without weakening their position at all, so it's going to cool for them. And we'll see. An attack here did not succeed. Ludendorff made another made an attack as well up against here that didn't work. Largely, uh, the Entente just shifting forces around in response. Just no points to make attacks, you know. Um, I can't afford the extra point to make an attack. Plus, the losses, the possible replacement points, etc. Maybe next, not this next fortnight, but next turn. One thing you don't have with this game, and the arrows seem to specifically create the issue, is the idea of a prolonged offensive. You have that prolonged offensive in La Grande Guerre where 
you know, you commit to taking a hex and you just keep hitting it. And if you fail to take it, or a small segment over here, if you fail to take it, there is a cost to that. There's also a cost to refusing to try, you know, which I think is worse, but it's hard to tell. But that costs us in national will, which is kind of a weird sort of commodity. It's not real money. And this, you know, for the Germans to make this attack, to try to widen this breach, it's actually less efficient. And they're better off continually shifting their attacks. And if this gets taken away from them, then it becomes more valuable. The only exception is if I knock Verdun down, it becomes somewhat more um, enticing to launch the attack there. I thought I repaired that. I guess I did not. I didn't spend the points for it either, so yeah. All right, I put the unit in. So now to the second fortnight, and I don't expect much to happen here either, to tell you the truth. The second fortnight, not too different from the first. Another German attack by Gluck here, not much effect. The Russian, uh, no German attack in the east. The Russian, uh, left a unit back here. Hey, you know, shit happens during wars, right? The Russians made a, launched an attack here against, uh, against Lemberg. Um, Austrians got reinforcements, and that sufficed to stop the Russians from gaining what would have been a valuable uh, a population center, at least. It's not a fortress or anything, so it's not worth uh, any morale check. But, uh, in, you know, they actually got a pretty good roll, which is why they ended up only losing one unit. Um, one of the things I'm seeing with the Bleeding Dry, you know, if I had more money, I would build more troops and I would lose them, right? I mean, there's just no way to regain the force pool the way you have it. And I don't know if that's, um... See, the, uh... I don't know if that's a function of my psychology, but it does feel like what I've got is too little to conduct the kind of offensives that historically happened. And that's what really worried me biggest about La Grande Guerre, and it really worries me here, is I've got this real paucity of force, and I don't have the points. It's not like I'm swimming in points and haven't been building the units, but I just don't have the forces to press forward. Now, the Germans could have built a few more units, and they might build a few extras. Uh, the other side, it's probably not. Uh, really all the other powers are dancing down around the hey you know if, if the germans had built up a little bit more force they would have gained some ground on us and that's pretty much all that would have happened or else you know cost us more units or whatever they, they would be attritioning us more effectively um so it's kind of tough to to see what it means though is that with the german attack they've been you know taking risks on the attrition rolls and such so they don't lose more units because they just don't have enough and they do have points and points are cheaper to lose than units anyway points for attrition only cost you one whereas a unit costs you two replacement points worth of stuff plus the time to build it anyway that's the end of uh july so we're moving into august everything's in supply still and i'll load this one up